the fastest growing talk show podcast in America. Welcome to the Jay and Brian show. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Jay and Brian show. We are back on the air with a really good friend of ours, Chris Kirkpatrick. Hey, Chris. Uh, Jay Chris, and Brian welcome. show, of course, powered by My City Lender Home Loans, a refreshingly simple way to get a home loan. Uh, we'll have links down in the description for those of you who are listening, uh, who are in the housing market. I know there's yeah. not a lot of people in the housing market <laughs> right now, but <laughs> At the hey, moment. you never know. Um, but uh, we're we're excited about uh, having Chris on the show again. Chris, welcome. Awesome, man. Well, it's, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. You know, I um, last time I was here, some of the the top performing TikTok videos I've ever done were shorts from our last conversation. Really? Yep. Yeah, That's awesome. have, and that was about awesome. a year ago, right? Uh, a was little more about? than a year ago, probably. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I've had a couple, a couple video clips from our last conversation that had, like, one of them had almost two million views. Two million. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's pretty cool. So, if, if you're watching uh, the Jane Bryan show for the first time on on YouTube, thanks for tuning in. Um, and if you like it, definitely smash that subscribe button. Chris is the reason why we learned about doing shorts in the first place. Like he's the reason why we, we formulated the Jay and Brian show the way we did and, and put those shorts out. And we've had a lot of good play on those as well. That's so, awesome. Yeah. I mean, it, it only makes sense, right? Like if you're going to create content, you might as well yep. multi-purpose it and create more value. And mm -hmm. not everybody has the attention span to watch an hour long interview or I like, know. you know, <laughs> and we have learned from one of the best. <laughs> yeah, well, industry. thanks guys. Uh, so Chris is, uh, he's joining us from Life 180, mm -hmm. which yep. is, uh, tell us a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, so Life 180 uh, is an acronym. Uh, it's Living Intentionally for Excellence. The 180 is about turning Love your life it. around. Uh, the reason we came up with that name is because, unfortunately, as you guys see, uh, most people's personal finances are not in alignment with where they want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we live in the most prosperous world in the history of the world, pro prosperous country in the history of the world. And yet 95% of people are reaching retirement and not able to maintain their standard of living on a guaranteed basis. Like Man. think, think yeah. about that. It's mind numbing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're living right now in 2023, we're coming through, uh, you know, the greatest bull run that we've ever seen in the market. Um, so as we go through these cycles, like what happens is people get this false sense of security, right? And, and we've so- We've been talking mm -hmm. about this lately. Yeah, yeah a, there's lot, a lot of that, for a lot sure. of false sense of security. 100%. And that is the natural cycle of things. This happens constantly mm -hmm. over and over. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the market, you know, we 2008 happens, 2007, 8, 9, right? And then people are scared to death. And so that creates this, uh, this, I don't know, mindset and fortitude of wanting to create and, and but people tighten up and people act more responsible. But it's amazing how short term thinking we are as a species like mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. because like with by 2015 everybody just forgot 20 yep. 2008 ever happened yep. right and so like we're in this situation where it's like all right uh people feel really good because 401ks there's more people with a million dollars in their 401k than ever before mm -hmm. you know there's there's people have more equity in their home than ever before you know, all the things going on with uh, interest rates going up and all this stuff and inflation and whatever. And we'll talk about all that, I'm sure, as we go here. But, yeah, yeah. but at the end of the day, like this false sense of security is all based on the fact that we have this bull run. And the bull run was based on kind of, I would argue, fictitious kind of economic, not fictitious, they were real, but like uh, manipulated economic environment. Yeah. With, well, especially the rates. We're, low rates were kept low for a long period of time. Totally. But it's beyond low rates. I mean, it's quantitative easing one, two, mm -hmm. three trillions of dollars printed uh, mortgage deferrals, right? Deferment of payments on mortgages, on cars, on credit cards, yep. the stimulus money getting printed and people don't realize it. But, you know, money printing, everybody thinks money printing causes inflation. No, money printing when it hits Main Street causes inflation, you know, all the money printing in the QE that happened early in the in 20, you know, 2010 through 2020, that was all like going into the coffers of the banks and it was utilized as reserves and it gave more financial stability so they could loan. But, you know, it, it, it it's now kind of hitting the place where when they created this last round of stimulus and the PPP program and mm -hmm. the ERTC program and all this money that they're now doing these new programs that are taking and printing 
the trillions of dollars, it's going right into the economy. Mm -hmm. You know, people in, in COVID times, right? Like when, when they printed the, uh, the PPP money and then, and then the stimulus checks for everybody that just went right to people who were sitting at home with nothing else to do. And they fixed up their backyard. They bought new flat screen TVs. They did all these things and Mm -hmm. it, it boosted the economy that that's what caused the inflationary problems that Mm -hmm. we're having, you know, and you, you don't get nothing is free in this world. There's no free lunches, guys. Like you when you yeah. deal with this stuff and you, and you if you're willing to, you know, take a bite of the forbidden apple, you're going to pay the price. Right. You know, that's that's the way I see this. And so, you know, it's just I, but I, I know a lot of people are like super negative uh, and, and think it's going to be doomsday in a way like um, you know because it it go online it's it's disgusting right (laughs) the fear mongering that happens right there's a lot of it right now it's it's nuts and and like some of it some of the points are warranted but like the the end game is not right like a lot of people worried about the devaluation of the dollar and you know the world's reserve currency status lost like okay maybe long term there's some risk there but like from a short-term perspective and, and then when i say short term i mean like 10 years the the odds of that happening are like Mm -hmm. so insignificant like Mm -hmm. it's not even worth really considering but everybody freaks out about it you know because there's all these people talking about bitcoin and all this stuff and it's like we got a ways to go before that's gonna Mm -hmm. be taken over you know and so i don't know i just i just look the the market is cyclical we gotta like what we're going through now feels extreme it is extreme Mm -hmm. but it's no different than you know, you go back to 1979, 1980, and 81. It's very similar. It definitely feels like we're right back there. I do wonder, though, if, the, if you know, we're, if we are going to go into a recession. I think we were talking about that earlier. Yeah. You see, Chris, you, you're in the camp of we are probably going to go into a, a recession at some point. Yeah. It seems. Um, but I just wonder if, if this has staying power. I mean, the dynamics right now, you have affordability. That's kind of mm-hmm. what's mostly on my mind right now when mm-hmm. it comes to housing is affordability. And it's at an all-time low. And and yet with rates high, there's still, um, there's, there's, it's high rates, low affordability combining. We're you can't, losing first, a whole first-time home buyers, of buyers. Yeah, first-time home buyers completely out priced of out of the market. At this point, yeah. Um, yeah. How does in, it, in this how does area, it, how anyway, does, how does mm-hmm. how does affordability get turned around? How did? Do... <laughs> ah, well, you know, so like, and, and let's talk about that a little bit because, like, affordability is saying, all right, um, if you, if you look at the market, and I know you guys know this, but for everybody watching that doesn't understand it fully, is like as the market um, inflation happened, right, and housing prices went through the roof. Every, I think if you guys are like me, when 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 the pandemic first happened, I expected the market to tank. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I think everybody yep. did, mm-hmm. right? But a combination of the the government programs and mortgage deferrals and then the fact that, you know, rates were still low, people that people just kind of had this demand and and nobody wanted to sell their house though because nobody right. wanted anybody walking through their house and nobody you remember that? Like yeah. it was Yeah, so what what is happening right now at this moment is yeah. almost what we had all anticipated was going to happen in mm-hmm. 2020 during the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Which didn't and really happen. Well, because they kicked the can down the road. Right. Yeah. That's all they did. Yeah. Like and, yeah. and 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 that was like you could have just anybody you don't need a crystal ball to see that that this was going to happen right because yep. it's it's just it's economics there's no free lunch you can't mm-hmm. just do this stuff you can delay the pain you can you know yeah defer the the consequences but at the end of the day right now when we have interest rates going up mm-hmm. we still have a supply problem right like there's not enough people willing to sell their house because you got a lot of people like me and probably you guys that have their interest rates in the two and a half to Mm -hmm. three and a half to four percent range yep never going to get rid of that asset (laughs) right like your 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 asset is as much the low rate of a mortgage as it is the house itself right right? like because you can just turn around and rent that out like Mm -hmm. because like for me my wife and i are dealing with this right now we're in the process of making a move and we're gonna like and it's not a move move but it's a short-term thing in a normal economic environment we'd probably just sell our house and right take the equity out and go from there and just like re-enter the market maybe a year or two down the road when we come back Mm -hmm. right but now like it it, it, the fact that we have a three percent mortgage impacts our our behavior right yeah i mean and and so we are an example of a house that would be on the market 
that but, and now I, is I not. I love how you are saying this, though, how the, the mortgage itself, the rate you have on this low rate mortgage yeah. is just as important as the investment of the real estate itself. Yeah. I mean, mm. so and, and so for me, that just comes from the from the perspective that I just look at um, cash flow is is everything. So do you think that the buy the new buyers for today, mm -hmm. do you think that they're going to have the same are they having the same outlook today is what you just said as so it, because it's different because you have this right mm -hmm. and that is what your asset is attached to yeah right you've got this r super low rate that's mm -hmm. attached to, the, to your asset yeah therefore just you know that <laughs> well so the, the, my, my question is like if the buyers of today yeah. don't really have that to consider then all it is is a hope for the future yeah, I mean it's it's mm. challenging. Right? There's I, I think we're living in a time right now where there's so much uncertainty. There's uncertainty about what is the market going to do, where are the rates going to go, are, do we have inflation under control or do we not? The mm. government debt's 33 trillion and it's going up by 4.5 trillion a year like at unprecedented rates. We've got the war in Israel and and you know the Palestine, you know, thing going on that whole Gaza strip deal yep. Yep. that I try to not think about as if I don't have to, you know, like but this is all stuff that's that that is a real deal, you know, and I I, I just know that my phone, my Google feed on my phone, mm -hmm. uh, even though I try not to click on anything, keeps doing like, is the is the Israel war going to spill over into Ukraine? Is this going to happen? Right. Is World War Three coming? Like all this yeah, stuff. And I it's like seeing the same like, stuff. You know what I mean? And I don't click on it because I don't even want to think about that because I live through the <laughs> lens of like. I know what I can control and that's right. certainly not it. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And so yeah. uh, I want to keep my energy and my heart in, in areas that I know I have influence over mm -hmm. and, um, and that's not it. And so, um, and I, I think, you know, the challenge is though, I guess the point is the uncertainty that is created by the whole world that we live in. Yeah. Um, you know, I think our, our politicians are incompetent, you know, when it comes to this stuff, that's just my opinion. Uh, that's not a right left thing. That's just a across the board thing. And well, there, well, competence is one thing. I mean, that's part of it. It's it's you know incentive structure. Mm -hmm. you know, what what yeah. is a politician's incentive? Well, it's to spend as much money as they can on their yeah. constituents so that they continue to get the votes and maintain yeah. their seats and all that stuff. Yeah, you could certainly say there's a lot of like moral hazards built into our our. But how connected structure. are they really to what's going on at the ground level? Like what what's really going on with Not people at all. and their situations? And well, well, when's the last time we had um, a councilman walk into our office yeah. and ask us how we're doing on the ground? Right? Who? Right? Who? <laughs> well, so so happen? you know the affordability thing though. I think what's going to happen is things are going to keep going well because if you understand like what's driving the lack of affordability right now. It's the fact that interest rates keep going up mm -hmm. and Jerome Powell is getting here and he's looking at the unemployment rates. And as long as inflation, because remember, everybody's like, oh, inflation's going down. It's still double it is. where it should be, kind of quote unquote should be, which yeah. I think having a target of 2% is still ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. means if you don't understand inflation, you know, and, and the, the rule of 72 at a 2% inflation rate, that means your purchasing power gets cut in half every 26 years, right? So at a 4% rate, that's every 13 years. Mm -hmm. Much right? more, or, much more reasonable as yeah, far as the target goes. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, you know, it, and we're it's, sitting at like three point, what is it? 3.7 right now? It's 3.7 and, you know, gas prices were up. Now they're kind of coming back down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's things, but at the end of the day, we're, we're still looking like inflation is go, is higher than where it needs to be. So as long as inflation is higher than where it needs to be, Jerome Powell has an obligation to keep raising rates because that is the the nature of our fiat currency model. Mm -hmm. Right. It the is. government is going to the, the Federal Reserve is going to keep raising rates until they get inflation where it needs to be so long as employment and stays good everything right? else right? stays right because yep. don't forget inflation is just a function of our spending as a nation mm -hmm. right like as long as people can keep buying things I, I got news for you the economy how much money you're making the job rates everything all that would go away if everybody yeah. would just say listen i'm not going to spend my money i'm going to invest my money and I'm not going to go buy flat screen TVs and I'm just going to be a more responsible steward of my stuff and I'm going to take 
the the money that I'm earning right now, I'm going to prepare for the rainy day. I'm going to build yeah. my reserve account, my emergency fund. I'm going to like because I see this coming, that would accelerate this process and it would actually probably reduce inflation faster because the better consumer behavior would would be enacted. Less mm -hmm. money would be spending. The CPI would go down. But we're starting to see that now. Are we? I, I think on a forced basis. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, but th but there's a difference, right? Now they're being forced. It's it's, it's not a it's this is not a voluntary right. action. This right. is a forced action yeah. as a result of X. But that's what happens because what what's going to happen is if you don't do it voluntarily, like this. It, Peter Schiff always says this. People th and Harry Dent says the same thing. Like people always think economists always think they're smarter than the economy, but they're not, right? Like if if, if let's just take all of us. Like let's just assume that we have the choice of saying, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna voluntarily buckle down when times are good, you know, even though they're not really good, they're kind of fictitiously good, they're, they're manipulated into, in, you know, with, mm -hmm. with policy to allow it to feel better than it really is. And so we can take that and we can enjoy it and, and, and live high on the hog and do our vacations and buy new cars and buy new TVs and redo our backyard and do all these things. Or we could be responsible with it and prepare for what's inevitably coming, which nobody does. But but so so we can. But we should be because you know a a rainy day is going to come at some. Sure. Point. Yeah, but it's all you know, cyclical. should yeah. <laughs> is 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 not you know is not human <laughs> behavior, right? And so what what winds up happening is the government, and this is the Federal Reserve policy, and this is the inflationary policy, is that they say, all right inflation is going up because you guys are spending money when you shouldn't be. That's really what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so they go, we're going to keep raising rates until it gets to the point where we break you and you're no longer able to live this life that you have been accustomed to living. And you will then slow down, whether it's based out of fear or obligation or necessity, because you don't have that capital and you got to pay your bills and you know, all this stuff. And so that's what will then slow down. It's not the high interest rates. That, that shrinks inflation. It's the fact that when interest rates go up, affordability comes down mm -hmm. and eventually mm -hmm. you break and you stop spending money, prices correct to where they need to go. And then, the, and typically I call it the pendulum effect, right? Because like if, if everything should be centered on the pendulum, we've gone way too far to one side with, with cheap money and, and affordability was too too good and money was too easy. And so they have to, you don't correct it and get back to center by making it where it should be. You've got to overcorrect and and break the system so then it can kind of come back. And unfortunately, we never stay in the middle. The pendulum swings from one so, side to the other. So if they're smart enough, and by they, I mean Jerome Powell <laughs> and the Fed, if they're smart enough to know, you know, they're, they're, brilliant economists, right, to know that they've got to, they've got to be painful with the, the rate increases. Yeah. How come they weren't smart enough to see that we were keeping rates artificially low for so long? Hmm. And then on top of that, you have the, the you know, whether it was Trump, whether, mm -hmm. again, not right or left yeah, thing, the, I don't federal, if you could... the federal government pumping trillions of dollars yep. in stimulus along the way on top of keeping rates artificially low yeah, and that, that isn't one specific administration no no it's not it's you no, no, can no, pin no. it on it's, because it's, this has been exactly it started, rolling and rolling my, and rolling. my, my point started is, with bush and obama i mean like you can why, go back to reagan actually why weren't yeah. they smart enough to slowly be ratcheting rates up as they went along and didn't hold them at three to all of a sudden have to go okay boom boom boom, 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 boom. well they tried and that's the thing if you look at 2015 and 2018 they tried and this that this should be the indicator they tried to bump the federal funds rate twice in 2015 and 2018, and each time they did it, the market just took it in the, mm -hmm. you know what. Therefore, the quantitative easing period kicks well, in. And now, so what we're seeing is that we're gonna be in this quantitative tightening season mm -hmm. for, for what we've been hearing and reading. It's, mm -hmm. it's probably gonna take us through all of next year and mm -hmm. possibly into 2025. Or longer. Like, longer. Or who knows? I mean, and, and the, the worst part, so I, I interviewed Harry Dent. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's, he wrote a book called The Demographic Cliff. He's very, he's very negative on the economy. <laughs> but he's not negative it, just for the purpose of being negative. He used to be bullish, you know, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and, but he's, he's a demographics guy. So he, he's a cycles guy. And I think cycles are absolutely, you know, a relevant thing. A lot of people think he's a bit of a dinosaur and his, he's been kind of beating the same drum for a decade and okay, that's fair. Um, but a lot of what he's saying, the principles of it, the government's 
done a good job of kicking the can down the road and mm-hmm. doing monetary printing and you know quantitative easing and like just loose money and low rates and all these mm-hmm. things that you know that that have been able to fight against the demographics um the dem- demographic shift that we have but the bottom line is like eventually you got to pay the piper you know and mm-hmm. and there's no free lunch and so his his conversation around everything is that from 20 2024 to 2028 is supposed to be a demographic economic winter meaning that and that's not like you know game of thrones winter is coming kind of like evil but it's just saying hey this is a time where things kind of flatline things get really like hard because we have a contraction from from the institution of our government you know in the 1700s to today, we've only known expansion. We've only mm-hmm. known growth, right? Our our economy is only expanded and our economy is driven by people, right? Like, so right. it only goes to show that, you know, as as we have more people, that's what that's really what the government, when they picked a 2% inflation rate, they're saying, hey, we're, our, our population is gonna expand at about 2%. So that that's, that's kind of a good number, right? That That's really what it comes down to. And so hmm. for the first time ever, and in this book he talks about it is we are going to have a demographic contraction like because and this is the challenge because we live in this time right now where we've as a whole as a whole in the country we will like so so and we've been going through it we've allowed immigration to make up for the lack in birth rates the lack of Mm -hmm. expansion Mm -hmm. and all that stuff but now even with immigration we're going to have fewer people as the boomers are dying off Right. Right. As they pass on, Mm -hmm. we're going to have fewer people. So Hmm. not only do we have this whole world that we're in right now, you know, where all the things that we've been talking about and this kind of like period that the end of this cycle from uh, an economic policy perspective. But now we're also ending the end of a demographic cycle. And when you come and when you see think about it this way, everybody's talking about the supply problem. Boomers are now passing on and their their vacation homes and their second places and like all the things that they have they're they're passing on and there's more of them than Mm -hmm. there are people to replace them in their peak spending years to be able to afford it so as you know like that's that's a problem you know now then you could argue that like people you know organizations like blackrock are buying all the homes up and they're not selling them and they're not going to sell them Mm -hmm. and you know, so they may, that may counter it. I mean, so, isn't there going to be a major wealth transfer mm. over the next 10, 15 years as baby boomers pass on and and they transfer all that wealth to their heirs? And what sure. if, what effect will, will that? Oh, uh, it's a big. What would that look like? Huge. Uh, and that's a big uh, passion point for me with Life 180. And, you know, we, we do a lot of work in the life insurance space. Right. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. how you handle that transition of wealth and. Um, you know, how you, how you manage, you know, trusts and estate planning and stuff of that nature is a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because think about it this way. There's, there's a story of different families in the world of, uh, you know, the Vanderbilt family, right? Everybody knows who the Vanderbilt family was. Cornelius Vanderbilt was the most, he was the wealthiest person the face of this earth has ever seen. I don't know. Like everybody knows of the Rockefellers now. Everybody Mm -hmm. knows of the Rothschild family. Most people have heard of the Vanderbilts because of the the sheer success that Cornelius Vanderbilt had in building his empire. Mm. But the Vanderbilt family is basically broke today. They like literally. So I did I did this research study on them by 1971. They had their Vanderbilt family reunion and there was only one millionaire in the group. Think about that. Wow. Like going from being worth the equivalent of $234 billion in today's money, if you inflation adjusted (laughs) net worth from Cornelius Vanderbilt in the 1800s to 1971, only one millionaire. Like that is an atrocity. It's mind boggling. So when we talk about transfers of wealth, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because you say, hey, like what does that even mean? If you don't structure it right, if you don't have trust and rules in place, the kids who didn't earn it, they're just going to be irresponsible with it. Well, well I guess yeah, I, 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 I'm, and I'm asking that from a, a short yeah. term, short time frame perspective, mm-hmm. you know, say 10, 20 years. Right. I mean, yeah. the expectation is that plenty of irresponsible heirs will just spend it, but they'll spend it. They'll put it in the economy. Sure. They'll maybe buy houses with it. 
Maybe. 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 I mean, you know, but <laughs> typically just, speaking, they're going to inherit the houses. <laughs> they'll, they'll probably inherit those houses right. and they'll look to sell those. And so is there really any. Uh, so remember, mm -hmm. it's all about value creation. Like right. if we're not creating more value than we're, you know, taking from mm -hmm. the world, then mm -hmm. you know, that that's a principle that's not negotiable. Like that right. you have to have a value creation structure. And mm -hmm. The problem is like, typically speaking, these second and third and fourth generation, you know, people that are living a certain lifestyle and have been raised in a certain environment with a certain way of being that never really created that value. They don't understand. They just, they're entitled. Mm -hmm. And that, that is, and that's not judgment. That's just, that's human nature, yeah. right? Like that's just the way it, it goes. And, and, and so I think like that's, we're coming through the, 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 the greatest generation, if you look at their cycles go in multiple phases, right? Like, so you, we could say, Hey, you know, every eight to 12 years, the economy goes through this cycle because of short term buyer behavior and right. the, 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 what we've talked about so far. And okay, that's, that's great. But there are also larger cycles, you know, and we have the greatest generation from, you know, that was raised in the, in the great depression era. And so they knew nothing but pain and mm -hmm. hardship and, yeah like just, just grinding to try to get through life. Right. And so they were the most disciplined generation and they were the most like hardworking. We're not going to let that happen. And so they built it up. And so their kids saw the work ethic and their, their kids were the boomers. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so their kids saw that and then they worked hard, but at the same time they felt prosperity. And so they felt comfortable to be like, well, let's create families, right? Like, mm -hmm. let's do that. And so mm -hmm. they expanded. And so, that then perpetuated, but a couple generations removed, now the kids they have, they're like, ah, whatever, like life is just good, the 80s and 90s, baby, let's go, <laughs> right? Like, th and that's what's happened. And yeah. so now, if you look at it, and I, I just did this, like it's all about expectation management and um, like just knowing the cycle. And I think people in the economy, we look around and I think if you talk to financial advisors or you know people on Main Street about what, what, what do you need to do to be successful with your money in retirement and like reach your financial goals and be free and like, you know, be able to be financially independent and, mm -hmm. you know, take your, your, your hard earned working income, save enough of that money, put enough of it aside, prepare for retirement and, and reach that goal and be able to, to maintain your standard of living at whatever age you want, whether it's 65 or 55 or 70, you're like, whatever it looks like to you. It's the question is, and this is why I named my company Life 180, living intentionally for excellence. Like how intentionally, how intentional are you living around that? And, and you know, mm -hmm. making decisions around the right expectations to accomplish the goals that you say you want to live. And unfortunately, most people mm -hmm. just don't think like that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the challenge that we're, we're living in now is like, you know, if you look at the expectations that everybody has, it's it's out of whack with reality because everybody's like, oh, if I if I were to go down the street, if I asked you guys, like, what's the rate of return that you can expect? On what? On on <laughs> on like a long term portfolio investment. Four or five percent. OK, seven so, to ten. OK, so you're super conservative and I like where your head's at. Seven to ten is totally the answer think, that you get. I think that's what you would get. hundred percent. That eight percent is what most financial advisors are taught. And so my response is always why, right? Like, why do you believe that? And why, why is that what's being taught? Why? My question is when, when has anyone received this seven to 10 number that we've been told well, or higher? Right. When? Yeah. I can tell you that we have not received that. Well, because your parents did though. That's they, the reality. They probably did. They did. And, and so here's the numbers. Like, this is the crazy part from 1929 to 1979 the real return in the S&P 500 was about 4.5%, okay? From 1980 to 1999, the real return was 13.3%. Mm -hmm. from, from 2000 to today, the real return is about 4.4%. So outside of huh. this 20 year window, which ironically is when our parents were going, you know, were working and saving and 401k was created in 1980 as well and like started to become a thing. And so that's where more people started investing money in the markets. And so that's naturally going to expand the growth of the market because yep. small supply, more, more demand, in. more yep. dollars coming in. Yep. That's just the way it works. So it, it's, it's no wonder that this happened, but we literally have a 20 year period out of the last hundred years where it's been a certain way but they're using that as a, as a crutch to like, 
back up all their other numbers. Mm. But like historically speaking, outside of that 20 year window, relying on an 8% expectation is just delusional. So And so where do you go? Mm-hmm. And, and for, for us well, in the industry, yeah. we point people to real estate. Mm-hmm. You know, I love it. Because real estate's historically been one of the greatest returns if you're gonna make an investment. Yeah. You know, in in time and yourself and mm-hmm. investing in your family and where you know, everybody's got to have a place to live. But yeah. we, we would normally point people to real estate, maybe maybe more than the market. A hundred percent more than the market for yeah. me. I would never put money in the market personally. Um, and that's just a value thing. Like, so my biggest thing is this is like I I used to be really polarizing about my opinion about the market is evil. You should never do it. And and like real estate all the way or business all the way, right? Like, and I, so I used to be very opinionated and what I've really come to realize for me is that there's no right or wrong. It's just, is it right or wrong for you, Yeah. right? And as long as your expectations are in alignment and as my biggest thing is like, is your money in alignment with your values and beliefs? Period, right? Your values and your beliefs, I mean, we're all kind of in alignment here, right? So like, that's easy, but let's just assume Brian you know, didn't, didn't share those values and beliefs. And, 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 you know, so what I would say is I would say, Hey, Brian, what do you believe about taxes? And what do you believe about the government debt and inflation? Like how worried about those things are you? (laughs) Pretty worried. Yeah. So you say you're worried now. How do you protect against that? If you were asking most people that question and you ask them and they go, yeah, I'm pretty worried. That's most people are going to say that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and if I said, what's your degree of confidence about the government figuring this out and making it better? Very low. Very low. And most people are going to say that. Fair enough. Yep. But then when we talk to people and be like, so hey, what, where's your retirement savings? So what are you doing? <laughs> where's, your, where's, your, where's your money right now? Where yeah. are you saving? Uh, 401k. What are most 401k, IRA. Boom. Those are the two yep. biggest places where people from a tax perspective have their money. And, and the challenge is that's where it's most at risk if those are the things you're concerned about. Think about that. Yeah. So if that's the case, people don't realize it. But our subconscious minds, and this is something I've learned a lot with personal work I've done this year, is that our subconscious minds are so powerful, right? That there are things happening you don't even realizing are you don't even realize are happening in the way that you're behaving, the way that you're making your decisions. And, you know, like at the end of the day, if your subconscious doesn't believe you're going to be successful, you're not going to do what you need to do. And, And so like if your money is in 401ks and IRAs and you don't believe in the government and the thing now, if you're, if you're, you know, like a huge Hillary Clinton fan and like you, you know, like, and like no judgment, like if that's your thing and you believe in the government or whatever, then it's, I'm not saying you're going to win, but at least you're doing what you believe in. So you're going to give it everything you got. Okay. Right. That makes sense. That's the challenge. And so the reason we have a saving problem in this country, the reason that we have an investing problem and that people are not doing the right thing is because what's being taught is not in alignment with most people's values and beliefs. So what we have is like a bunch of people that are confused about they don't know what. And so the natural consequence of that is like, well, this just doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right. And so I might as well just enjoy life while I can. Right. Mm hmm. And they just and, inve- money. Well, and, and they'll just invest as little as possible. Invest like as little whatever as possible. Whatever the, the least amount that I can commit totally. to this, that's what I'm going to do. Well, everybody mm-hmm. wants a shortcut and there's no shortcut, but like. And I'm not going to look at it either. Right. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to look at it. I'm going to tell my friends, yeah. don't look at theirs either. Totally. Yeah, you know? yeah and that, totally. You, you see this. Like, yep. We see this. Like, so what's your, what's your plan? Well, so my and, plan is like, you know, what I say to people is like, we need to stop focusing on rate of return. First and foremost, we need to think about financial structure financial design. Uh, you know, I just created this new thing. It's called the hierarchy, hierarchy of financial needs. And it's like five different steps. And it's, you know, first step is cash flow. You know, most people, their greatest need is not, you know, I need to save more or invest more. It's I need to make more money. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> let's, there. let's be real yes. with where we are yeah. right now. Yes. I need to make more money. And like, yeah. like you can, you can try to go invest more. I promise anybody watching this video, I promise you, I don't care how much money you make, it, it, unless you're like really well to do. But if you're making a quarter million dollars or less and you're watching this video, your need is not to get better rates of return on your money. It's to make more money. And, and I promise you, if you're saving 10 percent, if you're following the traditional financial strategies that are taught to us in this country, mm. go to school, get a job, invest 10 percent of your money into a 401k or qualified account 
and that's what you're doing, and you're trying to chase an 8% rate of return, and you're taking the risk on that comes with that to be successful, you, are, you have so much higher degree of success by just focusing on creating 10% more cash flow in your life. And, and just saving that with no risk than you do mm -hmm. getting. Agreed. Right? Like, Agreed. That's it. So we need to stop thinking about trying to chase these big rates of return. And the biggest lie in, in the financial space, in my opinion, is the younger you are, the more risk you can take. Because the younger you are, the less risk you have to take because you have time and compounding on your side. Like. 100% agree. Yeah, that's a 100%. Really great you know? way to put that. Yeah, and you look back at, you know, like what we were doing in our 20s. Mm -hmm. And man, I'm, I, I look back at that and, oh, I, and I say, man, if I could have just done mm -hmm. this, if I could have done this consistently yeah. when I was 20 or 21 years mm -hmm. old and saved If only X, I had started investing when I was, you know, was 18 totally or 20 pounded. years old. Oh. So what would you say to an 18 or 20 year old today then? Save. Save. save, don't it. take risk, and let it, and let save. it compound, save, compound. And, and so here's the deal. When we look at, when we look at financial structure, everybody thinks they're investing when they put money into a 401k and when they, I don't care, Bitcoin, crypto, whatever it is, what, re, even real estate. If you are not uh, setting your financial structure up, so you're saving, so you have a financial foundation to deal with the downswings in the market cycles. Mm -hmm. If you're, if I don't care how much money you have right now. If you're leveraged to the point where when the economy goes down, like where we are now, when money, when lending gets restricted, when rates go up, when asset prices start to come down, it, the fact is most people are leveraged, right? Mm -hmm. All companies are leveraged. And so as interest rates go up, it, what's gonna happen is real estate prices are gonna come down, stock prices are gonna come down, asset prices across the board are gonna come down. So people are, like we said at the beginning, have this false sense of security, they're gonna wake up and be like, oh my gosh, like, what I'm, do we have I'll, here? I'm not, so, and this is the problem. So let, let's think about it. We have, most people have about a 40 year window, right? To make money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and be productive human mm -hmm. beings and, and ultimately plan for retirement. And then if you're not successful at the end of that 40 years, you're in trouble, right? And so, what happens is, is we just came through this great bull run. Everybody feels successful. A lot of people are, have been successful. Mm -hmm. But if your financial structure through that success isn't set up, you're still exposed. And so you need yep. to make, and, and what I mean by financial structure, I mean, do you have a foundation of safe, liquid, accessible, guaranteed capital that cannot lose money in a market downturn? If you don't, you're not an investor. You are simply a speculator that is enjoying a good run. And when it turns, speculators get smashed harder than anybody else. Yeah. And that's why we have this world, this country, this nation of people that are, are coming up short. Because what happens is we go through these cycles, people feel like they're doing really well during the bull runs, mm -hmm. during, the, mm -hmm. during the upticks, you know? And so they don't do the conservative things of saving. Why would I save money? If I, why would I put money in an account? Just keep coming in. Yeah, why yeah. would I put money in an account and do this thing, Chris, that you're telling me to do when, when I, you know, the opportunity cost, I'm losing money of not, not getting my 10%, my 15%. Yeah. It's like, that's great, but it's not real. You know, like none of it is real unless you build a foundation. And unless you can, you know, weather the swings. And if you don't have your foundation built, you're, you're not going to be able to weather the swings. And I, I wanted to get into this uh, in your intro, actually, but okay. then we just we blazed right okay, through it. Okay, cool. Um, but your your business is booming. Yeah, Chris, totally. Chris, like Life 180, Huge. like your your subscription yeah. uh, subscriber count on YouTube yep. is, has blown up yep. uh, just for anybody that's watching this video. You know, Chris's channel has really blown up. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's Life 180 yep, on you. YouTube. Uh, it's it's great. So how does that translate with um, not only the people that are inside the life in insurance industry, but other people that are looking to invest mm. in other things that maybe aren't the S&P or yep. are not a 401k or are not real estate. So this is where whole life insurance, I think, mm -hmm. comes in, right, for you. And that's, that's yeah. we should mention, that's, um, that's Chris's business. That's mm -hmm. uh, the, the YouTube channel is a really cool part of, of his whole enterprise, but whole life insurance is a business. So, so I have my question for you, because what you were, what we were just talking yeah. about, it, it sounds, it sounds great. Sure. Um, and it sounds smart and mm -hmm. responsible and, and, dur <laughs> and durable and yeah. sustainable. Why does Dave Ramsey not like whole <laughs> life insurance if he is if he is a 
um, you know, take good calculated yeah. financial risks, manage intention, manage your, your, your finances mm-hmm. intentionally and responsibly. Yeah. Why is well, there, he's why, a big is fan. There, why is there a disconnect there? Cause he's, he's a big fan. I, of the, I agree with you completely yeah. of the indexed, you know, like just a low cost, yeah. low risk index. But that's, but that's, like that's, that, that's, big, but that's speculating so versus Dave, real saving or yeah. investing. Like we've been talking Dave, about Dave Ramsey is really good at, um, helping people that have no financial, um, understanding and helping people, um, restrict, uh, and and be disciplined uh, to stay uh, to to accomplish a, a certain minimal goal, right? Mm-hmm. Be debt free. You're never going to get rich listening to Dave Ramsey. Like so, so it's not that Dave, once again, it's not is Dave Ramsey good or bad? Is it, is it good or bad for you? You know, and Dave, the person who loves Dave Ramsey, is going to hate me. <laughs> like that's just <laughs> the reality, right? Because Dave Ramsey's conversation is like, no, you should just go no debt. No credit cards. Credit cards are evil. Even though you can, like, if you're sophisticated and you manage them properly, mm-hmm. you can get good points and there's mm-hmm. tax-free benefits and, like, all the different things that we all probably understand, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so Dave Ramsey would say, no, you're too stupid. You're not disciplined enough. Um, credit cards are evil, right? Uh, you're too stupid to understand your money. You're not smart enough. You should just give your money to somebody else and let them control your future. Like, to me, I have a fundamental problem with that construct, right? Like... And and so, but I also understand there are some people that need that, you know, mm-hmm. if you need that, turn this off right now and go watch Dave Ramsey because <laughs> yeah. I am not for you. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and that's okay. Yeah. It's, and so like, yeah, I like to rip on Dave every now and then. And I, you know, because there's such a, uh, a polarizing like barrier between us and the way we view the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but the ironic hip, hypocrite, hypocritical part about Dave Ramsey is he made all his money as an entrepreneur and building business, right? Not investing in mutual funds, Dave, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so yep. the, the, the level of hypocrisy and arrogance that I see with him bugs me, but like, we'll leave that for another time. But like, <laughs> it seems like it. So, yeah. it, you know, it bugs me, but you know, for so why, know how you feel. Why, yeah, I know. Well, I don't really ever hold things back, <laughs> but like, so, so, but the, the reason, like, like, I don't understand why he doesn't, why he doesn't like whole life insurance. Uh, I think yeah. maybe like anything else, it's probably emotional um, because there are ways that whole life insurance is well and to, misrepresented. I was going to say to, to okay. clarify some yeah. of that the whole mm-hmm. life of the you know seventies and eighties yeah. is different than the whole life of the yes and no you know two thousand twenties. It didn't need to be. Um, it was just it you know now it's gotten a little more flexible. Companies are a little more intentional about the marketing and, and the ability to market the different designs of policies. You could do it back then. It just wasn't understood yet, right? And and so, uh, so nobody did it, right? Now there's a wave of people that really understand it. And, and we're coming through this economic environment where, I mean, think about it this way, like, I, and I was just ironically on the way here having a, like a battle in my chat, you know, my, uh, my comment section of one of my YouTube videos about Dave Ramsey, actually. And, <laughs> um, and, and this guy is like trying to tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. Cause I did this like short clip. It was about don't invest in bonds or CDs, do this instead. And it was talking about putting your money into a whole life policy. And this guy's like, don't period, do period, this period, like, and I'm like, oh, cause you're like so smart, you know, like, like, please tell me what would you do? Or like, why do you disagree? Cause I don't ever back down, you know, like if you're going to make a comment on my channel, life of a YouTuber, I'm just yeah. like, I'm not going to back, th- like you yeah. make a comment, don't be an idiot. Just like, you know, uh, back up what you say, yeah, be prepared, yeah. be prepared. Cause I'm going to have a conversation with you. Cause I, I believe emphatically and wholeheartedly in what I do. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not scared to have the conversation around it. A lot, yep. I know there are a lot of- Because you know it inside and out. Right. And you're educated on it. Exactly. And you're not afraid to talk right. about it. And I'm not going to put something out there that I don't know I can back up. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah. it's a, I'm, I'm not in the, you know, the, the game of sacrificing myself like that. Like and just getting <laughs> eviscerated by people online. Yeah. So, so this guy's like telling me this and, and I'm like, all right, here's the deal. The, the whole, the, the title of the video is don't, don't put your money in bonds or CDs, do this instead. It was talking about a whole life insurance policy. Now, granted, I did this video two years ago, right? So the world has changed, right? Like okay. interest rates have gone up, savings account rates have gone up. Back two years ago, if you could have a high yield savings account, you were making maybe three quarters of a percent to 1%. Now you're earning four and a half to five, yes. right? Like, so, okay, so that dynamic has changed. But 
you can't solve long-term problems with short-term thinking. And a lot of people are like, why would I put my money into a whole life policy that will earn me four and a half to five percent long-term when I could just do that in my savings account and not have any of the short-term downsides? And my answer is like, all right, that's great. And we've just talked about the right fact now, that, right now, exactly. right now. That's great. Talk to me three years ago. Talk to me 10 years from now. Like, where are we going to be? So and, you're, you're defending a position on a video that you made two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And maybe perhaps he just watched it yesterday. He just he definitely night. just watched it yesterday. You know, so because this video still gets about, you know, a thousand views a month, you know. Okay. And so it's it, it's you know, it's still and that's a beautiful thing about YouTube. Right. Like as they just it keeps coming. going. Right. And and so like it, the the information and, and, and quite frankly, the the reason I filmed the video, the environment has changed. Right. Because the conversations change, but the principle doesn't change. Right. Like, because that was my next question is like, is the, so, so the, the climate has changed, mm-hmm. but does, did the content remain the same? hundred percent. Yeah. And okay. that's the beautiful part. And that's why I love what I do. Right. And, and so like Dave Ramsey, here's, here's what I say to people. And, 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 and I deal, I train a lot of agents. Right. And I, and, and so everybody's like, Hey, Chris, how do I sell life insurance? How do, how do I, how do I get this to be, to make sense and be relevant for people? Yeah. And my answer is this is like, once again, like we talked about, you have to put your money in alignment with your values and your beliefs, right? So, so I would just say, hey, Brian, do you know what an emergency fund is? Maybe you could ask Jay this time. Jay? Hey, Jay. Yes, yes. <laughs> Brian's like, why are you always picking kidding. on me? I'm just kind of angled keep, and looking keep, at you. You keep but asking me every question. I mean, man, I get all the tough ones. Do you believe in emergency funds? <laughs> yes, Do you know what it is? Absolutely. Yes. Do you six think months, it's, right? Do you think yep. it's important? So, so you think plus, you should have six months? At least. Right? At so least. if I were to ask most people, do you think they have six months of emergency no. funds saved? You no. guys look at a lot of people's personal finances. No way. No, we know that's... What percentage of people do you think have six months liquid accessible and guaranteed places they can access in case of emergency i mean it's got to be 22 percent. no 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 no. i was going to say in the single digits probably okay. percentage wise okay so five percent maybe okay so let, let's just call it 10 percent for the sake of like so nine out of ten people don't have their emergency fund so when i talk to when i talk to my agents and they're like, hey, Chris, how do I do this? Does that include my credit cards, Chris? No, <laughs> no, please don't. So, so, but the, the whole idea here is like, all right, so when you ask, and this is coming back to your question, Brian, about like, why does Dave Ramsey hate it? The answer is, I don't know. Like, it's either, I, I, my, my real answer to that is, I feel like Dave Ramsey has just like been selling the same song for so long that acknowledgement or admission of it would be like, catastrophic to his entire brand mm, at this point in okay, time. Okay. And so there's that there's that side of the marketing game and the business game that he's just not able to yeah. acquiesce at all or whatever. And so but it, but at the end of the day, I look at it and I go, all right, if you believe, remember, is your money in alignment with your values and beliefs? And we're talking about financial structure, making sure your foundation is built. So the 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 emergency fund is the absolutely a part of that foundation. If you cannot have a solid foundation without the emergency fund built. Agreed? Yeah, totally. Okay. Absolutely. So if that's the case, to me, I'm looking at what is the best and most efficient place to save money from a long-term perspective that is liquid, guaranteed, accessible, is performing multiple functions. And so when we look at money inside of a whole life policy, the downside, and we can't ignore the downsides, the downside is that on a short-term basis, you're going to lose 10 to 15% of, of accessibility to that capital. Mm-hmm. So if you put in $10,000 a year and that's what you're saving, well, in a savings account, if you were put in a, a high yield savings account, you're going to have access to all 10,000 and you're going to have a 5% return, let's call it, which is great, right? Like, but that 5% is taxable. Right now. It's taxable. Yeah. And that's great right now. You know, and, and, you know, a couple of years ago and probably a couple of years from now, that won't be the same, right? right? But whole life will keep on keeping on, right? It always does it. Mm-hmm. Not to mention, so what, what, what whole life does is, is you're going to have a short-term liquidity crunch. Instead of maybe 10,000, you'll probably have 8,500, right? Accessible. But with that crunch comes benefit. You get life insurance. So if you're like any of us and have families, that's important, right? Mm -hmm. You have living benefits. If you become critically, chronically, or terminally ill, you have access to the death benefit while you're alive. I'm huge on controlling the medical directive in my life, right? Like my, my father-in-law, you know, the story, um, pretty intimately with us as we've talked about it. My father-in-law was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer on November 4th, 2020. And they gave him 90 days to live. The oncologist said, Radiation chemo doesn't even make sense. There's not mm-hmm. much we can do. Maybe we can get him to a year, but his quality of life is going to suck and yep. whatever. Um, multiple six figures out of pocket, alternative treatments. 
uh, he's still alive playing golf four days a week and playing with his kids three years later. Right. And they give him 90 days to live. And, and that's because we didn't give up control of the way that we wanted to handle things. Right. And in most people mm. don't have that ability. Right. But you know, if you have access to capital and you don't have to just handle your, some of the most important things and elements of our life and just do things the way we are doing them medically because the insurance company tells that that's our only option. Yeah. Like it gives you power and, and, and that empowerment allows you to show up differently in your own life and for your family and all these things. And so like, that's a big thing to me. It's a self-completing plan. That's a, like, I always kind of tell people like, Hey, you know, you Jay, you can save $10,000 a year and that's cool. Like, you know, and, and you should like, and if you're average American making a hundred grand a year and you need six months, okay, you need 50 grand in, in liquid, safe, accessible places. But at the end of the day, what happens if something happens to you in the next four years? Like a whole life policy by saving it here is the only financial product in the world that will make sure what you want to happen will happen when you want it to happen, whether you're here to see it or not. Think about the power of that for mm -hmm. your family. Like it's, it's world, it's mind blowing, right? But then when we look at it and we go, all right, seven years from now, like when we think about looking long term, seven years is typically the break even where it's like, all right, your whole life policy is going to be right on par with your bank account. But on top of the bank account, you're going to have the same return as we're getting right now, about four and a half to 5%, not sexy. You're not going to blow the socks off of anything, yep. Yep. but that four and a half to 5% is going to be tax free, right? Compared to a bank account. Because which, it's earning within the policy itself. Yeah. It's, yeah. and you're getting <laughs> dividends and you know, uh, the guarantees and the dividends in the policy, it grows tax free tax deferred. You have access to it tax free, uh, through policy loans and withdrawals up to cost basis and you have the tax free death benefit. So from a, from a legacy planning perspective as well, and from a retirement planning perspective, I mean, I could talk for hours about all the different flexibilities of it all, but yep. going back to the Dave Ramsey thing, it's like the problem that I have with Dave Ramsey is he goes, I hate whole life insurance. It's the worst product. And he's like, you're an idiot. If you buy whole life insurance is what Dave Ramsey would all tell right. you. And I've heard him say it a hundred times. Right. <laughs> and so, so the ironic thing, I wish I could get on Dave, if you're watching this, please give me a call. Like I want <laughs> to have this conversation with you in a public forum is if you believe Dave, which you do, or Dave Ramsey, believe that you need six months of emergency fund, where's the most efficient long-term place to keep that emergency fund money? And there's not a place yeah. better than whole life insurance. And so, hmm. and then the cool part about that is I look at it as, is it's an emergency fund, but then it also becomes an opportunity fund, right? And that's where I think is, is what will create real financial freedom for people and real opportunity for people. Mm -hmm. As you're asking, like, what do we do? What do we do now? You like, you know, there's that phrase dry powder, you know, you want like, you want to have dry powder and, and available for you when times get tough, when the market gets, gets really, really ugly. Warren Buffett says you want to make money when there's blood in the streets, you know, like that, like all these, like kind of like cliche kind of quotes. But at the end of the day, it's all relevant because what's happening is as the market gets down, as it, as it goes through a down cycle, human behavior becomes more and more pronounced, right? Because people, desperate times create desperate measures for more, most people. Mm -hmm. And it's the pendulum thing. Like if they were living way over here, feeling like really comfortable and then boom, the pendulum swings way over here and they're desperate. Well, that's when asset prices crash. And if they should be here in the middle, and that's where they really belong while well, they overcorrect. And that's where the opportunity is. But the only people that take advantage of the opportunity are the people with the opportunity fund. Right. Yes. Right? Like, yep. like yes. It's, it's not rocket science, everybody. Like <laughs> this is just and, and the thing is, is like for me and I didn't create this. Like I learned this from a guy and, and he was like and I asked him, I'm like, dude, why? Why are you like not trying to get the 10 to 15 percent? He's like, Chris, that is how broke people think like. If you're trying to chase 10% a year, you're, you're playing a losing game that was created. This system is created not to help everybody succeed because if it was created, think about it this way. Common sense, guys, everybody watching this. If our financial system was created for everybody to be successful, 95% of people wouldn't be failing. Mm -hmm. If it were 50-50, we could argue human behavior. 95% the system is designed for people to fail. Like, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know how you guys feel, but I, I feel emphatic about that, obviously. You know, so like, if that's, that's true. the case, like if it's set up for you to fail, so like, let's use common sense. It's a losing game. 
trying to chase 8%, 10% per year and just buying and saving and holding. What are we doing when we do that? We're putting our money into accounts that are tax deferred. But that's even if people can get there. Mm -hmm. They're not even getting there. Mm -hmm. They're not. Because they don't believe it. Well, there's this whole, just the whole, um, this consumerist mindset that Mm -hmm. everybody's kind of uh, bought into or they're buying into. Not not everybody. But there's a lot of people that have bought into this consumerist mindset that it's almost like enslaved everyone to their phones. It's enslaved people Mm -hmm. to consumerism, to buying like the most expensive thing, even if they can't afford it. Mm-hmm. subscription mm-hmm. after subscription after subscription this is the yeah. consumerist mindset i gotta tell you so how do you educate people <laughs> to avoid this at all cost it's hard um i'll say for me when i'm you know we're moving uh doing this this shift in life for our you know we are launching this real estate investment fund and we're buying this hotel in the dominican and doing all these things and my, i'm moving my wife and three kids there for 12 to 18 months right and we'll i'll go back and forth but it's, it's, you know, talk about the consumerism and, you know, we're, we participate in that obviously. Well, no, no, the, the mindset mm-hmm. is a program. Mm-hmm. Like it's a program that the, mm-hmm. the most, exp- the, the most, the wealthiest people in this country, mm. they want the consumerist mindset to be programmed oh, into for sure. all oh, of its absolutely. users. Yeah. And that's yeah. where we're at. That and, is true. And, yeah. and we're all a, a victim of this at this point. Myself included. I mean, to to some extent, yeah. Myself oh. included, and it's like, so how do you snap out of this trance that we're all in, hmm. and break it? Because in order to get to the point where you really want to, you know, yeah. save to invest or mm-hmm. save to, you know, better your family, you've got to snap out of the consumerist mindset first mm-hmm. and foremost. Yeah. To get to a point where, okay, I do want to build wealth and a legacy for my family. Well, I challenge everybody to kind of like do an audit on what you have going on, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And 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 so so I was having this conversation with somebody the other it's day. It's not even New Year's, right? You know, and we're gonna, yeah, totally like, like this is hundred percent. Do an audit, and 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 it's not an audit on. Um, so well, let me put it this way: I, I it was about two weeks ago now, so this is really new. So I'm still working through this, so it might be a little choppy, <laughs> but I talk a lot about financial efficiency. Right. So what what people don't realize is like the whole idea of of, you know, hey, I earn one hundred thousand dollars. I need to save 10 percent of my income and try to get a return. And that should be enough. Technically, that's what our system teaches us. It's not true, but that's what people are taught. So my mindset is if you're saving ten thousand out of that hundred and you're trying to chase a 10 percent return, what is the potential? It's you're taking a lot of risk to maybe make a thousand dollars of interest. Right. Mm-hmm. Of, of growth. Right. So my mindset is if if we focused on being more efficient with a 90,000, we could get the same results with less risk and have more control over the results in Absolutely. our life. Absolutely. Right? And so, and, and so people don't realize, I could go and say, hey, do you have 1% of inefficiency in your life? Finances, 100%. It's probably more like mm-hmm. 20. Right, you know, for yeah. most people. So, yeah. so, but the thing is, is like when we look at it like that, and if we break it down and get simple about it, I could say, all right, it's fair to, fair to say what I've seen is 5% is kind of like, Somebody who's really, really good and on point, 5% is kind of the inefficiency number where it's like, all right, everybody's got at least that. So on nine, $90,000, 5% is 4,500 bucks, right? Mm-hmm. So if we could just focus on the 5%, that's the equivalent of a 45% rate of return on the 10,000 that we're investing. <laughs> Think about that. Mm-hmm. So if we just mm-hmm. focused on efficiency, we could get to a better result with less risk and be in 100% control Absolutely. of the results in our life. But people, yeah, that's pretty awesome. people are not living intentionally yep. for that. Right. And so like that's Brian and I are always joking about how, you know, with, and, and Chris, you can relate yep. with three kids. It uh, seems like as a dad, you know, it, generally it seems like we're always kind of in tow. You know? Oh, <laughs> like, totally. We're just kind of like, Whoa, we're like yeah. in the wake somewhere, you know, out here or whatever. Yeah, but it's we're like, gonna go this way today. Yeah. Wait, what? I didn't even know about that. <laughs> well, I told you about that. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. I don't know. Hundred percent. So it's like, how do you get from you know living in the wake, constantly being towed, mm. to getting out front and taking control of your finances, taking control mm. of your family, and can take uh, taking control of this this mindset that we're all like in tow mm. all the time. Yeah. To get ahead of it. Yeah. I, I think. I think it's, I, I heard this statement one time. I can't remember who said it, but it's like, if you're not living life by your plan, you're living it by somebody else's plan, right? 
And it's so true. Yeah. If you're not spending yep. your money, if you don't have a, so, and one of my, one of the agents on my team, Sebastian the other day, and, and he runs a uh, company where he helps people rebuild credit and business, build business credit and stuff like that. So he's really brilliant with this stuff. He's the approved guy on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And, um, he says, if you don't have a plan for every dollar, that dollar has a plan for you. And hmm. it's, it's so true. Right. It is. And, and the challenge is, so this is the new thing that I've been working on is like financial efficiency. I used to look at it just like what I was just talking about, like the dollars and cents and the percentages and all that stuff. To me, financial efficiency is actually much more than that. And this is what I've been realizing in all these conversations I've been having about our values and our beliefs and what we want to accomplish and living intentionally to kind of create a life that we want to live. And so it's not that like a lot of people like Dave Ramsey will, will shame you for going out to dinner all the time or shame you for taking vacations and doing all these things. If you like, so it's not a matter of the good or bad. Is it, is that in alignment with your values and beliefs? And, and is from a financial efficiency perspective, it's money is a tool to live the life that we want to live. Right. And if we look at it through that lens and it's like, okay, am I using this tool responsibly to create the life intentionally that I want to live? And most people just, the problem is they don't even know they, they couldn't articulate the life that they want to live. Hmm. They don't know where they want to be three, five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Or are people just mostly a living in the moment? Well, that's the problem well, for sure. That's it. So if yes. you're, if you're camped out in the moment, sure. how are you well, ever going to think about, you right. You know, the long term or exactly five years from now or 10 years from right. now, or what does this look like when my 100%. Well, everyone is aging and, and I don't mind well, that. Well, TikTok has only exacerbated the instant oh, gratification God. culture. Yes. Just, yeah. We're just scrolling along. Yeah. Like, <laughs> totally. Oh, there's another cool one. Oh, another cool one. And I don't mind dopamine, living dopamine, in the dopamine. moment dopamine. if living in the moment is intentional, <laughs> right? Like if living it like, so here's the deal. It's like, I could be like, all right, is um, living in the moment, going out to dinner and spending 200 bucks on dinner at a, like a big fancy dinner with my wife. Okay. That's if I'm doing it every week, that may be a problem. Mm -hmm. Like if we're, you know, I'll, I'll be real. I spend more money going out to eat and doing stuff like that. than if people saw the amount of money I spend every month <laughs> on that, um, they, it'd be easy to criticize. That's me probably a place a where okay? we could find a lot more efficiency. Fair, fair. Most people could. Yeah. For me, it's not a make or break situation, mm -hmm. right? I realize there's an opportunity cost to that, right? Like for most people. And if times got really tough, that's an area that I would be able to tighten up you know, yep. but for me, I look at it as like from, uh, beyond just the dollars and cents of it. And, and when we look at it from a values and beliefs perspective, well, I value my marriage. I value not fighting with my wife. I value not having to do dishes. I value, you know, not arguing about who's cleaning the kitchen and the time that we spend with each other and all that stuff. So to me, it's more than just the money being spent. And granted, I understand that's a luxury that, you know, the, the, the work that I've done to be able to get to the income that we have mm -hmm. is affordable. But rather than this comes back to our first thing, my greatest need is not to cut back on that. It's to create more cash flow to be able to afford it and create the life that I want to live. Right. And so it's, it's just, it's not that going out to eat is bad. What would be bad is if I were not being intentional and if I didn't have a measurement of everything that I had going mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or if there was no plan to pay for those meals, hundred percent. You know, well, right. and I think, you know, just getting back to Dave Ramsey, I think Dave would say, okay, and I've heard him say this before. Yep. Okay. So some guy calls into the show and he said, you know, I, I want to buy this. I think it was a Rolls Royce. Mm. Should I buy this Ro Rolls Royce? And he says, well, what, what do you, what do you make? You know, what, what's your, what's your income? It's yeah. a $300,000 car. What's your income? Sure. I hope you don't mm. tell me it's 300,000. And the guy's like, no, actually, I, you know, I bring in about, you know, two, three million a year mm -hmm. in my business. And he's like, buy the Rolls Royce. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can afford it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, my problem with this, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with any, anybody owning a Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. My problem is, is if you can't pay for it. Yeah. So to relate that to your story about going out to eat, well, yeah. if you can pay for the meals and go out to eat, it's, it's different than, okay, I'm, well, put, I'm putting every meal well, on a credit card I don't know. I, and I don't I, know if I, I can I, afford this bill. I, I have a, I have a problem with highly expensive, you know, hyper cars. Cause I mean, at, at a certain point, you know, you, it's an homage to you and your success. And mm. what else could you be doing? Like with that my, money. my kids, my, the kids came to me not too long ago and they said, Hey dad, you could, you could buy any, any, uh, uh supercar that you want. What mm -hmm. would you buy? And I said, I wouldn't. Right. No, 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 dad, you don't understand. 
just, you have all the money in the world. You can buy whatever car you want, whatever supercar you want. Which one would you buy? I'm like, I, I yeah. wouldn't. Yeah. No, I dad, agree. maybe we're not, maybe, maybe you're not understanding. Like, I'm, I'm not saying you're really going to go mm-hmm. out. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear. And my answer is I wouldn't go spend half a million on a car. I would spend a hundred thousand on a really, really awesome decked out Raptor, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. F-150 Raptor. I would, I would give some of that to charity because what are we doing with our money if we're putting right. half a million into a car that's not serving yeah. anybody but yourself? Um, and then save the rest, invest mm-hmm. it, do, do something long term with the rest of that money. And they're just looking at me like a blank spare. I'm like, no, I would not go buy a like, Bugatti. I'm going to buy a plaid Tesla <laughs> and I'll just dust any Bugatti out. You know, like I mean, well, those r- things are like, uh, yeah. yeah I, mean, I don't consider, I don't consider those like, those aren't supercars. I'm talking yeah, no, about, no, no, no. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think the, like, I, whatever, I don't want to judge anybody for doing their thing, but like, I'm, I'm in your camp. Like I would never spend money on a supercar, but but I think it, it all comes down I'd to get like, the Lambo. It'd be blind. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah you would. Get okay, you're, all right, that's fair. So we'll just ride in his Lambo. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll pick you guys. Well, you know, one at a time. You I'll one pick you guys up. So you know, I, I, I think I'm a car guy. Hey, you know, are you? Okay, okay, that's fair. Yeah, you. I get it. I get it. Um, I don't know. I just I, I think it's it's just about intentionality. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a matter of like, I would challenge anybody to be like, all right, do an audit, not an audit, not a budget, not like the boring you know, necessary, right? Like, I mean, their budgets are important. And I think understanding, I always kind of tell people, I don't like to look at um, a budget as a budget because it feels restrictive, right? And I think psychologically budgets are tough for people. Mm -hmm. I'm an entrepreneur. I look at my budget like a P and L. On a cash flow basis. Mm -hmm. On a cash flow basis, right? So I would encourage everybody if you struggle, if you if you've thought like, oh, I need to do a budget, or I, my husband and I, or my wife and I have talked about doing budgets, and we can just never get there because it just feels it's a hard conversation. Like as a husband, right? We, I, I've been there, right? I've had to have the conversation with my wife where I'm like, hey, honey, things are tough. We gotta restrict. We gotta cut back. You ever tell a really good-looking, successful woman <laughs> that she's gotta cut back? <laughs> it's not yes. a fun conversation. Yes, I have actually. It sucks, right? Mm-hmm. So. It's another thing rather than do that to be like, hey, we got to take a look at our personal Mm P&L and take a look at what's going on right now. The market's shifted. We got all this thing. We're still on a trajectory of growth and we want to do that. So in order, like any business, you know, we got to look at the cash flow and make decisions to make sure that, right, to make sure that long term we're going in the right direction. Right. And that's so stop looking at your personal life like a, like a personal life and a budget and start thinking about it like a business and a P&L. I, for me, it's right. about it, budgeting is about finding subscriptions we don't need and yeah. getting rid of yes. them, like figuring yeah. out, oh, my gosh, we're still paying for that. Yeah, it's, Gone. A, it's a lot. <laughs> Ironically. So the funny part about that is like a month ago. Um, about six months ago, I went through this process. I'm like, I got all these subscriptions. I just need to get rid of them. And so I subscribed to this app to solve my problem with subscriptions, <laughs> right? Like, right. And so like last month on my Apple thing or my Google, my Google uh, store, I got charged for this app for the six month in a row that I didn't use to solve <laughs> it. Right. And I'm like, Damn it. <laughs> ultimate fail, trap, you know, trapped, you know, like, and I'm yeah. like, all right, you know, like whatever, I just got to take the time to do it. Yeah. And I'm actually going to, yeah, there, that's a whole different thing. But, you know, I, I, I just think, I just think yeah, it, it's when you, when you look at it through the lens of a PL and when you're really intentional about where you want to go, mm-hmm. it's, it's Simon Sinek talks about start with why thing, right? If you understand not, it's, it's the, Everybody knows what they do. Fewer people know how they do it well, and even fewer people understand why they do it. But if you don't really connect with why you're doing anything, you're never going to have the the staying power mm-hmm. and the success. It's, it's purpose. Yes. It's purpose. It's purpose. And so, like when we when we look at it like that, if you don't understand 10, 15, 20 years from now what you want your life to look like and what you're working towards, and you can't emotionally connect with that. Mm-hmm then doing a budget is pointless because you're never going to stick to it because there's no why behind it. Right. Like, yeah. but if you can understand like, all right, this is our end goal. Now you have something to work towards. And now it's not like I need a budget. It's I need a P and L cash flow statement and a balance sheet yep. to figure out how do I get to my why. Mm-hmm. Right. That's such a different paradigm shift for most people. It is right. And, and if you do that, it puts you, simply by being intentional and living your life by design and being intentional about that, it puts you living your plan and not somebody else's. It puts you having a plan for your dollar, not your dollar having a plan for you. It puts you in these situations of control and power, you know, but it's all a matter of like, 
if you follow, what is it? Like you follow the herd, you're going to get slaughtered like a sheep or whatever the yeah. statement is, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it and, and it's, it, you look around and it's like most people are not living the life that they want to live mm -hmm. yet. We're all like most people listen to the people that are not living the life that they want to live. Right. And it's, it, it's success is, is simple. It's not easy. Right. There's a big difference. And you got to be willing to go slow, to go fast. I, I'm a big believer yep. in that, mm -hmm. you know, like, and you asked earlier, what would I do if I were talking to an 18 year old and I got a 12 year old who's going to be right. 18 before I know it. Right. And so yep. my, my mindset behind this is if I'm talking, if I could go back and talk to my 18 year old self, you know, I would say, Chris, you're super talented. You, you are going to make a lot of money. You're going to be an idiot. You're going to blow a lot of money. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. And here's some things you could do to, to kind of flatten the curve, right? To, <laughs> to not ride the roller coaster quite as much as you've chosen to ride the roller coaster, right? And the things would be save money first. Don't invest. And there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Understand the difference between saving and investing. And save money before you invest, but save money with the intention of investing. And do that first. Because when you do that and you come at it from that perspective, you build your financial foundation, you put yourself in the category of being able to be an investor, not a speculator. Because remember, you can go start investing in Bitcoin and, and, and you know, buying stocks. But if you do that before you have savings, you're not an investor, you're a speculator. Well, a good question I think to ask yourself yeah. is, can I afford to invest? Can I afford sure. to invest? Yep. Which means that do you have a cushion to fall back on yeah. in order to say that you could comfortably invest in this X, Y, Z investment? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's 100%. And if you invest in the investment, can you afford to lose it all? Right. Hmm. Yeah, one of, the, one of the questions that we always ask ourselves is, what's the upside? What's the downside? Can I live with the downside? Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. that's a good one. Worst case scenario. Yeah. Can I live with the worst case scenario? And if the answer is yes, then go for it, you know? And you know, that's okay. Like, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, there, there are situations like, Hey, the downside is, you know, you put a hundred grand into something and you could lose it all. And there yep. have been times we've done that and it happens and it happens. Right. Yeah. And there have been times back before I understood this framework, but can you I, still fall back on you well, know, whatever you've got? So the answer, savings. the answer now so, would be well, like, I wouldn't get into a situation where I couldn't. And, and the answer in the past is I did it in my twenties and early thirties and couldn't and ended yep. up paying the price for yep, it, yep. you know? And, and I think that's what happens because once again, if we have a 40 year window, if you go through one 10 to 12 year cycle, if we understand the power of compounding, one which is why I say the younger you are, the more risk you can take is the biggest lie in finance. Because if we have 40 years and, and we live this because we got out of school, you know, and, and it was the 2000, 2004 it was booming it was amazing like we yep. got into it and then 2008 happened right mm -hmm. and then you know that came with its own ripple effects uh, effect of consequences or whatever and so we had a lost decade right i think everybody our age pretty much did mm -hmm. yes and so mm -hmm. if you take 40 years and because i took all that risk before i was able to now i took 40 years and i cut it into 30. When is all the money made on a compounding cycle? At the end. At the end, yeah. Right? Yep. So I basically took and I, and I shortened up the greatest earning power potential years. Everybody's like, oh, well, you have the ability to make it back. So you're younger mm -hmm. and like. Yeah, because stuff no. happens. Yeah, but, you I get, mm -hmm. yeah. but you don't need to do that. Like if you're young, you have the ability to create a plan where you don't need to take that risk. Like yeah. you need to start taking risk when you're older and haven't been successful and you need to start throwing Hail Marys. Like that's yeah. when you need to start taking risk. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. a football game. Like they don't start just throwing bombs into the end zone from the 50 until it's like clock is ticking yep. and yep. it's going down to zero. Last and two you, minutes. Yep. you got it, you know, and it is what it is. Before that, you have a game plan. Speaking of the clock. So yeah, maybe this is a good, probably a good spot to land yeah, sure. our conversation yeah, today. Yeah. I hate, so I always, I always, I always hate yeah. ending our conversation <laughs> with you because it's like, I want to keep talking about all this yeah, stuff. We can and keep going. Um, and we'll definitely have you on again and Anytime. again. And I love it's it. Been, it's been we awesome as often. always. 
Um, appreciate you yeah. spending a few minutes with us today. Uh, it was so much fun. I actually, uh, we're going to have to do another video in a couple of minutes because I want to ask you guys about what's going <laughs> All on. Right. We didn't even get into my questions that I have for you guys. So I will have so, a link to that video yeah. in our description. So awesome. you'll have to head over there and check that out. Perfect. That's great. Yeah, no, guys, thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. I mean, I could literally talk about this stuff all day. Awesome. <laughs> all thanks right. again, Chris. Thanks, thanks again, Chris. Yeah.